All right, welcome uh, once again to the youth ministry uh, session. Uh, hope you are doing well. Uh, let me share my screen and we'll get started. Okay. All right, so just to do a quick recap of what we covered in the last class, uh, we discussed uh, the second chapter, which is youth ministry with a vision, right? The importance of having a vision, uh, the profits, the pros, the positives of having a vision, and, uh, and the negatives of not having a vision for your ministry, and right? the impact that it can have both positive and negatively, right? So having a vision will always help you grow your ministry. It will help you keep a track of your growth as well. It will help your team, the people that you are leading, follow you better, okay? And we went on to see how um, we've designed the, the purpose and the vision of the youth ministry at APC, the method that was used. Uh, you can probably, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, use use the same method for your ministry in your in your workplace. Uh, you know, uh, to come up with a vision and a vision statement that is was used using the Great Commandment and Great Commission. And uh, breaking those two verses down, we get worship, ministry, evangelism, fellowship, and discipleship. Right? We went through in detail the importance of all the five pillars um, that will help grow your ministry and how to come up with your own uh, mission or vision statement, the importance of it. Okay, so one, we learned uh, why we need to have a vision. Two, we go, in the next step was what will be the vision. And three is how we're going to go about accomplishing that vision. Okay, so vision is the big thing. Uh, you must have heard this, right? The vision, what is the difference between a vision and a mission? Right. So, for example, the vision is to win the war. The mission is to take over one city at a time, right? To conquer one city at a time. That's the mission, okay? Or a rescue mission. Our mission is this. So, in <clears throat> operating, uh, uh, winning, uh, achieving that mission, solving that mission, that goal, small goal, the short term goal, takes you one step closer to your bigger vision, okay? So, that's what we kind of covered in the last class. Uh, Today, we look at uh, identifying your audience, okay? Identifying your audience. Sorry, I'm just having a little bit of allergies. Um, okay, uh, identifying your audience. Um, and I want you to kind of talk with me, guys. Um, so what does this mean to you? What, you know, what is the importance why do we need to identify our audience? What would you, what would you have to say? Why is it important to identify uh, our audience, the people that you are serving? Why is it? Come, come, speak to them. Dave, Kanan. We must speak things according to our audience. We must speak things according to our audience, okay? Making plans for a specific group would be easier. Yeah, making plans for a specific group would be easier. Easier in what, Dave? And Kanan, when you say we must speak things according to our audience, could you also elaborate on that? Explain that. to relate to them emotionally, spiritually, okay? Yeah, 
Yeah, um, I think, um, I mean, that's, those are a simple ways to put it, right? Uh, put it across. If making plans for a specific group would be easier to relate to them. Okay, you see how that continues. It would be easier to relate to them emotionally, spiritually. So the important part there is being able to relate with our audience, is it? And then the audience to be able to relate with us. So it's not just one-way traffic, it's both ways, right? So you should be able to relate to them and they should be able to relate to you. And that is why it's important to identify the people that you are ministering to, uh, right? The, who your audience are. Yeah, for example, in the context of leading worship, uh, if I'm going to uh, say, for example, to a Methodist church, uh, I have to do my research, my study on, okay, what is the background and how the people, the congregation, of a Methodist church is like, and what kind of songs can I do there, right? I I can't go to, uh, you know, like a more traditional set of uh, church who uh, who do a lot of hymns and they start doing some full-on hill song or planet shakers kind of a thing. And so they come on, come on, jump with me. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen, right? So I failed in uh, identifying my audience. So that's very important and crucial uh, to serve uh, your people better to, to serve your congregation better it's very important for us to identify uh, who your audience are okay so first step in that is identifying the commitment levels so one program can't effectively fulfill all the five purposes which is evangelism worship fellowship discipleship or ministry right um, what primary purpose does this program fulfill so you need to ask yourself when you're doing your, uh, your when you're planning a program or a youth meeting, whatever, right? You are trying to focus. Okay, what purpose is this program going to fulfill? And then you go to talk, choose the topic that you want to do, etc. Right? And then the next big question: Who are we trying to target with this program? And who are we trying to target with this program? Okay. I, once again, coming back to the point, one program can't effectively target all youth. One program can't effectively target all youth. What do you mean all youth? Why can't it target all of them? Like everybody's youth are youth, right? What's the big deal, you know? Uh, how can they be different? But then if you look at the, the passage below, uh, there are at least, I'm saying at least five types of youths, okay? The list doesn't end there, okay? Uh, it can go on, but just a few examples. So there can be a youth who is not a Christian, or there can be a youth who is new Christian, right? Uh, or there can be a youth who knows a great deal about the Bible, uh, but is apathetic about most things we do. Uh, it's like, eh, okay, I know a lot about this thing, the Bible, but... Eh. Okay, uh, the growing student or the spiritual leader who's like, you know, full on committed and whatnot, right? Um, there could be a youth who is forced to attend a, attend a youth meeting because their parents are told that youth to attend. Okay, so you, you see, right? That's just a few examples of how the, <laughs> we can't just come to a youth meeting and say, okay, youth meeting or the ages are from 17 to 33. They are all, you know, youth. They're all in the same stage in life now. Out of, out of the 50 people that come to a, your youth meeting, there could be all these people in the different categories, right? Um, and so who do we cater to? This youth meeting, I'm going to focus on the spiritual leaders, on how I'm going to equip them even more. Okay, so that could be a, the topic can be a little bit more uh, theologically heavy, slightly, right? You can, you can talk a more advanced topic. Uh, or the non-Christian, you can have like an evangelical uh, youth meeting. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the love of Jesus, uh, etc. Uh, the new Christian, you can talk on the discipleship topic that how they can grow in their journey as a new Christian, etc., uh, etc. Et right. So um, you know your audience. You kind of have a, an idea of who you have, and then you know you start planning. The events like you start doing it backwards okay so uh identifying coming back to the point of identifying your audience uh now this is a very popular uh you know 
diagram, so to speak, image that tells us usually where uh, your congregation is. Okay, uh, so you have the core people, okay, like they are part of your core team. They are, they are, you know, they are like they are part of all the decision makings. And then you have the, those in the committed circle. Okay, you have your volunteers who are committed. Okay, they will come. They will uh, Sunday after Sunday. They will, uh, you know, they will set the stage. They will set the chairs. They will clean the chairs. They will sweep the church. Uh, clean the church, etc., etc. They are committed people. They are part of a life group, whatnot, etc. And then you have those in the congregation uh, who will faithfully come Sunday after Sunday, uh, you know. And but that's about it. And then the circle keeps getting bigger. And then you have the crowd. If these are the kind of people. Okay, even before the pastor says the benediction, escape. Okay. <laughs> They don't want to meet people. They don't want to have anything to do uh, with that. They just want to put an attendance once again. You know, it's like, okay, I'm here because my parents wanted me to go here. I'm here. I came. I listened to the message. Even before the benediction is done, they are out of there. And then they are coming, like the, uh, the other circle who don't, they just don't care. So you have all these people, right? And now we have to identify, like, who's in our audience. So. Um, the goal is, although uh, this is relevant, this can be relevant to most of the churches, congregations in the West and whatnot, at APC, uh, and according to my observation, not all of them are relevant. Uh, you know, we, I could, um, based on the observation, we could relate to crowd, the congregation, community, and the core. Now, these were the five audiences that we could observe and, uh, and identify. Okay, only three the crowd and congregation and kind of bring them merging them together okay so what do they mean um the crowd and the congregation people they attend church they may or may not have given their lives to jesus uh they are shy and introverts right they just escape after service they don't want to meet with people talk with people they don't want to have coffee hang around uh, and whatnot Okay, so you get what I'm talking about, right, guys? I hope you are. Uh, so they are the people in the outer circle, right? The, the crowd and the congregation circle, right? They attend church, all good, right? but they're not committed yet. That's where community comes in. Okay, now the circle is getting a little bit smaller. There are There is a bunch of people, there is a group of people, not only attend church, but they are committed to growing spiritually. And they also volunteer in different ministries. Okay, uh, and then not necessarily proactive, but definitely interested in growing. What do I mean by that point? Are not necessarily proactive it means they don't necessarily take uh, take the make the first move and say like, uh, can I help in this? Uh, I want to do this. Can I do this? Can I help? No, but that's being proactive about it, right? But every time you approach them to help you they will always be ready to help you. Okay, so they are the uh, audience uh, in the community circle. And finally, you have those in the core circle. They not just attend church, not only are they committed to growing spiritually, not, are, not only do they volunteer in different ministries, but they are proactive. They make the initiative. They take the initiative and say, okay, hey, where can I help? And what are we going to do about this? Can we do this? Can we do that? Right? They are committed to doing ministry. It is these kind of people who go on to become uh, life group leaders or youth core team leaders. And then from there on, you see so many uh, youth core leaders grow into uh, you know uh, different levels of ministry uh, in church. Okay, so this is what, what we call it as a circle of commitment. Okay, this is the circles of commitment. So as the uh, circle becomes smaller and smaller, right? The commitment level increases, but the people decrease. Why? Because the commitment is a lot, right? Uh, and actually, uh, I would recommend uh, this book called The Power of Commitment from, um, from, it's an APC publication, which you can download it from our website, uh, apcwo.org slash books. 
Uh, it's a small 30 pages book. I would uh, encourage you to read that book and also if possible, you can teach uh, that book uh, you know, into your church uh, members, uh, your youth leaders and whatnot. It teaches the importance of commitment, right? Uh, who, uh, uh, the characteristics of an individual with who is committed. Okay, so each group size will decrease as commitment increases. The circles of commitment remind us of our potential audience. Okay, that's why we learned about that circle. The circle of commitment will show us our potential audiences who are who's in the audience. Okay, so now that we've identified, okay, so you know, let's say you have 50 youth uh, in your church and you go through them list by list okay name by name it's like okay this guy okay joseph okay joshua yeah joshua is in the outer circle okay um and then you have uh, let's say you make a list of these people according to their uh, commitment levels now that you identified them it doesn't stop there right you don't just identify and not do anything about it like, okay yeah they are in the circle circle what is the next step what's the next plan Okay, the goal, once again, going back to the vision should be, okay, how can I bring these people who are in the outer circles to the inner circle? Now, not necessarily all of them have to become core leaders. That's not the goal per se. But how do you get them to become more committed? Right, at least that should be the goal. So bring the outer ones to the inner ones. Okay, to the inner circle. So let's take a look at a few examples, right? So reaching and keeping crowd and congregation youth. How can we do this? How do we reach out to the crowd and the congregation youth? Not just reaching out to them, how do we keep them? Because they are in the outer circle, it is very easy for them to just slip out of the circle and be lost and be gone forever. Isn't it? Right? So because they are there, they're so vulnerable in their outer circle, it's very easy to lose them. That's why we have to ask this question, how do we reach out to them and how do we keep them? Okay, so make sure you have a program to which your regular students can feel comfortable inviting their community friends. Okay, make sure you have a program to which your regular students can feel comfortable inviting their community friends. This service will have Christians and non-Christians. <clears throat> Don't limit worship just to music. Attempt to have praying, singing, giving, testifying, thanking, and listening to God's word, etc. Create a positive atmosphere of fun, student involvement, but with a clear message. Simplify your message. Okay, this is one way of planning for that. Okay, small groups are a great way to nurture the student who has graduated from the crowd. Okay, this is amazing. So small groups are a great way to nurture the student. Okay, like, because they are comfortable. They will, you know, most of these introverts or shy people, they open up and talk when the group is small. Right, they're not too hesitant to speak. Right. Small groups should provide more personal attention than larger programs. But they provide a sense of belonging. In the crowd, you share the gospel. Right? Because, remember, guys, so people who are in the outer circle, the crowd, the, co the congregation, remember, there can be youths who are saved or non saved or not saved. Or there can be a new Christian right, who have just started their journey. So in the crowd, because you want to make them stronger, you share the gospel, you share the good news, right? Uh, in small groups, you share your lives. Okay, so in a bigger uh, in a bigger program where you have 50 people uh, in the program like that, you share the gospel. Right? When it becomes smaller, you share your lives, right? Saying, okay, this is how Jesus touched me. This is what he's done for me, right? And, and you tell a little bit more about yourself. This is who I am. I was, I'm a sinner saved by grace, right? I was into this, so, 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 and so. But, uh, you know, just reading the Bible every day helped me, et cetera, et cetera. Right? You guys with me? And I'm talking too much. But I hope you guys are with me. 
Okay. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Dave. Okay, and then we have preparing community youths. Okay, so remember this. The first one is point was about how do we reach and keep the crowd and congregation youth. Okay, it's all about reaching out to them and keeping them. The next thing, the people in the next inner circle is the community, isn't it? So preparing community use. We now prepare them to, for what? Let's take a look at it. Encourage spiritual habits through the small groups of the congregation. Okay, encourage spiritual habits through the small groups of the congregation. Have consistent time with God through prayer and Bible reading. Have an accountable relationship with another Christian. Okay, having uh, encourage them to find a mentor, understand the participate, uh, understand and participate in giving and in tithing, memorizing scriptures, studying the Bible, communicate ministry messages, uh, etc. Help students discover the spiritual gifts. Okay, so here we are preparing the community youths to become the core youth members. Okay, you're molding them, you're encouraging them, you're training and equipping them. And then finally, the core team members, we don't really have much, but to just challenge them more. Okay, challenge them to do more. Uh, if, you know, if they're not leading a life group yet, you tell them, okay, start, why don't you start a life group uh, by yourself? Right, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, those are the simple ways of identifying your audience uh, and not just identifying them, uh, how do you, uh, you know, reach out to them? What do you do uh, to, uh, you know, to keep them and to prepare them, right? So that's, uh, that's just a simple chapter three. Yes. Okay, uh, just at this point, do you have any questions, anything that you would like to share? Thomas, uh, Siddhar, to see you, Siddhar. Uh, any questions? Okay. All right, I'll take that as a no. Uh, great, so let's move on to uh, the next chapter, chapter four. This is youth ministry in the local church. Uh, and we're going to learn about the organizational aspects of it, okay? The organizational aspects of uh, how do you go about uh, organizing the ministry, uh, administering the ministry with the youth ministry, the uh, more particular, okay? Uh, the weights are set at APC is I have the senior pastor, Pastor Ashish Raichal, and the youth pastor. Uh, I report to the senior pastor directly. And then we have the core team members. My right? core team members, and we have five locations at APC. One is central, and then we have north, south, east, and west. So we have core team members from each of those locations to serve that location, okay? So, once again, let's look at the role of the pastor, the senior pastor, right? The pastor is the one who is ultimately responsible to God for the church. To, so every ministry team comes under his pastoral oversight, under his supervision, in other words. Okay, so he provides general vision. He provides direction and motivation. He shares his gospel. He shares his goals for youth ministry. Right through the youth pastor. So, uh, you know, I would every time we'd have a meeting with uh, the senior pastor, I would ask him, like, okay, pastor, uh, you know, what would you uh, want, what would like to see happen? And then he would share, as like, okay, uh, and I would like to see youth ministry, the youth reach out to the city more, uh, reach out to the youth in the city more, etc. Okay, so he would share his goal, he would share his vision, he would share his heart, uh, etc. Okay, that would be his role. And then, now, now that we've seen the role of the pastor, what is the role of the youth pastor? Just a few, couple of things. Um, so pastoring in itself is, can be intimidating, uh, you know, most of pastoring the youth, right? it can be very challenging, uh, but it doesn't have to be. Pastoring is related to the word shepherd. It means to guide, to provide, to protect, and care for others through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Okay? We learn to care, we learn to guide, we learn to protect 
and for others through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So how then do we take care of the teams and congregations that we are interested in? How do we do that? Okay, uh, some key points that we can look at is, and I cannot emphasize enough on this point, guys, is make relationship central. Okay, emphasize on personal relationship, on building rapport. Pastors have to have a lot to keep a track of. And if we are not careful, we can become too focused on the planning of an event and execution of an event rather than the well-being of the core team members and the youth. Okay. Uh, you see, this is absolutely crucial. We can, we can get so busy in just planning for a program, uh, for an event and whatnot, and then we completely lose track, a vision of being able to care for the core team members and the youth. Okay, so although completing tasks are an important part of the process, it is secondary to relationship, right? First with God and secondly with each other. Okay, once again, do you see how it is in line with uh, what we from the, the greatest commandment that Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Okay, make, make sure your relationship with, with him is right. Okay, your life is a lifestyle of worship. And then the, it leads to the next part of the commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, first with God and secondly with each other. In James chapter 2, uh, he says this is a royal command, isn't it? But if we miss this, we miss everything. Okay, you missed the point, you miss everything. And the second part is in line with the first one, that when your relationship is central, you will lead your people with care. Okay, uh, and in a simple old uh, quote, it says, the youth don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Okay, the youth don't know how much you know until they know how much you care. Okay, so as a youth pastor or as a church leader or whatnot, uh, you can have all the degree in the world, you can be a master and so and so, etc., etc. All of that will really not matter, right? Like I said, uh, the youth care about how authentic your, you are, your life is, how genuine you are. Right, about their well-being, right? So uh, if, if, they, if they see and if they know that you don't just care, you don't care about their well-being, uh, anything you say will not matter to them, okay? So that's why making relationship central is, is crucial, is essential, that will help you and enable and empower you to lead and care for your youth, okay? And finally, Rely upon God, right? Rely upon God. It's important at all times to maintain a posture of humility, okay? Relying upon God is a posture, is a sign, is saying, it's a beautiful posture of humility. You're saying you, I'm dependent on you, Lord, okay? Relying, being dependent on God for every decision you make is crucial. It's easy to become dependent on your talents and gifts or be overconfident because you've done something well in the past. Okay. Actually forgetting that it was God who helped you do something well before. Right? How many of us have been there? I've been there. Like, oh, well, we did this last year and it, it, it was great. It was an amazing success. So let's do that again. Same thing here, this year. Nothing wrong with the method. But being dependent and going before him and saying, well, is this what you want us to do now? I can't be, can't, we cannot do this on our own. We need you. Right? Um, so that is relying upon God uh, in... And I, I have learned that personally in leading the youth ministry is, is I'm any, I'm sure it's the same with when you're leading any ministry. Uh, but anytime you go before him and saying, 
Father, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do this year. What would you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And you come before him in humility, and then he, he starts unveiling his plan, his, you know, his vision. He starts revealing his heart for the year ahead. And so um, that's crucial, isn't it? Um, so the first three, three points, the role of the youth pastor is make the relationship central, uh, and then the events and everything secondary. Because you cannot do events uh, without the people who has to help you in doing those events. You need to care for the people who are volunteering, who are giving their time, their energy, their you know everything in in helping you, uh, you know, do that event. Right. So it's not like you are being sly and using them. Okay, let me just do this so that I can use them to get this done thing done. You need to check the intention and the motivations of your heart, isn't it? Uh, right. We we don't use them or abuse. Um, abuse uh, any individual when they're volunteering, right? You are genuinely interested in their life, right? And then you and you seek God uh, genuinely uh, to help you in your journey, in your walk, in your ministry. Okay, so that is the role of the youth pastor. And uh, some and some of the things uh, you know, like I mentioned, we have the court. Right. So first we have the senior pastor and then the youth pastor, and now we have the core team. What, what is their role? Right. So the core team will comprise of a few selected youth leaders from each location. The core team will work with the youth pastor to plan, organize, and mobilize the youth to help fulfill the vision and, and the mission of youth ministry at ABC. Core team members are requested to be regular at the, at the youth core team meetings. Core team members are to lead by example and serve the young people at APC. Okay, and some more responsibilities of the core team members. Our core team members will maintain a strong personal spiritual walk with the Lord. Okay, uh, core team members will see their responsibilities as ministry unto the Lord. Core team members will be regular in attending monthly core team meetings, and core team members who are team leaders of volunteer teams will send in regular email updates on their areas of ministry to the youth pastor. Okay, so those are some of the roles and responsibilities of the core team members. And uh, having understood all of that, uh, now we see how some of the events uh, or the youth meetings uh, are organized. Okay, this is how it's planned. Um, because at APC, it's a unique situation. And, uh, you know, we have five different locations, as I mentioned. And uh, and since I am not uh, in the only present, I can't be at all locations at one time. We have to divide uh, and plan, uh, you know, the meetings accordingly, you know, week after week. Um, so the topics will be focused on how young people can apply the word in their life. Uh, the sessions will encourage group discussion in which all young people can share their views, etc. And so the third Sunday, uh, the youth meetings will happen at East and South simultaneously. And if I'm not there in one of the locations, the youth leaders will, uh, you know, lead a session at, 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 the, at, the, at the location. And every fourth Sunday, we meet at Central. Okay, so this is MYM simply means monthly youth meeting. A pit stop is a combined youth meeting where uh, once in two months or once in three months, depending on the calendar, where all the youth from every location will meet uh, on a Saturday at Central. That's what we, we call that combined youth service as pit stop. Okay, uh, so some of the dates that's planned uh, for the year of pit stop is this, I mean, with the with the topics. So on Jan 26, we, uh, we had a, a pit stop, it's like a youth connect it's a, it was a vision casting meet. And uh, then have another pitch talk. We call it Dare to Share. This was focused on evangelism, equipping a youth on how to share the gospel. Okay, that's why we call it as Dare to Share. Uh, and this, the third pitch talk, April 25th, was focused on the same lines, on equipping the youth in a little bit more in an apologetics way, like uh, learning the uniqueness of Jesus. So we can... Uh, if we come across people saying, why should I choose Jesus? Why Jesus? 
uh, this topic would focus on that. And then we have the youth camp and the pit stop again, uh, and, and as you can see. So that's, that's how the pit stops were planned, um, the combined youth service, in other words. And then we have the youth life groups. The youth life groups are the life of youth ministry. And I mentioned this is also the life of the church, right? It's small groups, small uh, house uh, gatherings. This is where relationship, discipleship, spiritual nurturing, care, loving community, and spiritual ministry will happen. Okay? Um, this is where they grow and they are discipled, they're equipped. The youth life groups are part of APC life groups and will be under the oversight of the life group coordinator and also the youth pastor. Okay, so and we have separate life groups for young men and uh, young ladies and young couples. So this is how it's categorized. Okay, uh, we have separate LG life groups for young men, uh, young women, and young couples. Okay, and in some life groups, it could be a combination of young couples and uh, young ladies, right? or you know. It depends. Uh, youth life group leaders will report back directly to life group coordinator. And uh, we must encourage youth leaders and other young people who are mature to start new life groups. Okay, so that it doesn't it doesn't just stop in having youth life groups, but we keep preparing. Remember, going back to the audience uh, in the community. Uh, is that you prepare them to become life group leaders. You prepare them to become, you know, take on the responsibilities, but become more proactive, right, in their journey as uh, as leaders. And then we have youth mission trips as well that we plan every uh, once a year. Uh, we haven't done that since the pandemic, uh, but it's something that we will be looking forward to do. That okay? it's it's a perfect opportunity to be discipled and to and to serve, learn to learn more about ministry in itself, right. Uh, we go most of the time. Some mission trips have been to North India, to Gujarat, Dawun, uh, we want to Bharampur, Odisha, etc. Okay, so that's youth mission trips, and then we have campus elevates, where we go into schools and colleges uh, and and share on some of the found foundational, fundamental topics, um, etc. Okay, and uh, yeah, it's all in line. Campus groups are small groups of students gather in a coffee shop or in people's homes or, or on campus uh, with the opportunity to go deeper, build friendships, and discuss issues relevant to them. So uh, basically, this is how uh, uh, the youth ministry, uh, uh, the organizational aspects of youth ministry, this is how the youth ministry is organized at APC. Okay, so we finished from chapter three and chapter four. Uh, do, do you guys have any questions at all? Because we, we will stop at this moment and continue next week. Any questions, any thoughts uh, regarding youth ministry? Okay, great. Okay, thanks. There are no questions. All right. Um, right. I hope you uh, were able to see the assignments uh, that's assigned. Okay, let me just stop the recording for now and we will continue the next uh, class. Okay.